<laughs> All right. Good morning, everyone. I hope everyone's having a really great morning this morning. As Miss Megan said, my name is Scott Tice, and I'm going to be a I'll be your tour guide. We're not an instructor today. We're just going to talk about some things that I think are important that are going to affect a lot of us going forward. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and we will get started. I know we have a, a limited amount of time, so I want to utilize every moment that we can. There will certainly be time for questions at the end of the day, which means we're going to have to move along at a bit of a brisk pace, but we will get there. So hopefully everybody can see that. And get everything set up on my side, and we will be ready to go. All right. Well, just as the title slide says, we are going to be talking about navigating the MUTCD, and we're going to talk about the 2023 updates, which are soon to drop. And we'll talk all about that. And then the last thing we're going to do today is just as Ms. Megan said, we are going to talk about here are the changes that are anticipated for every part of the MUTCD. I think that'll be towards the end, and then we'll have some time for some questions. As she said, my name is Scott Tyson. I am with the University of Florida. I hope that doesn't offend anyone. I hope we can all be friends. I'll be in Kentucky uh, in a couple of months, so uh, come see me. We can talk a little football, basketball, whatever you feel like doing. That'd be awesome, but I am with the University of Florida, and if you have any questions after this webinar, you can certainly reach out to Ms. Megan. Uh, there at, at uh, the Kentucky uh, LTAP, or you can reach out to me directly. Either way, I'm happy to answer those questions. All right. Well, that's a little bit of the housekeeping matters. The last thing I want to tell you is the whole reason we're doing this webinar, well, one reason is I'm on what's called the National Committee, and that is the National Committee on Uniform Traffic Control Devices. So that's why I have all the information because I'm, unfortunately, don't be mad at me, but I'm one of the people who helps drive the rules that are written in the MUTCD. So we'll talk a little bit more about that when we get to the updates. All right. Well, here's my vision for what we're going to do today. First of all, because I never know who all is in the class, we're just going to lay a background, the foundation for what the MUTCD actually is. When does it when does it apply? How am I supposed to use it? When do I have to use it? Uh, we're we'll talking a little bit about signage, a little bit about pavement markings. And then once all of that is done, we will launch into, okay, here are the updates that are proposed to the MUTCD. All right. Well, first and foremost, I keep saying MUTCD. If you're not familiar with it, that is the Manual on Uniform Traffic Control Devices. And if you don't mind, I just want to ask a question to you all if you want to be as interactive as possible. From the phrase Manual on Uniform Traffic Control Devices, which one of those words do you think might be the most important? Manual on Uniform Traffic Control Devices. And you feel free to chat in and Miss Megan will read them off to me or I can. Which one of those words do you think stands out the most as most important? Okay, I see some responses coming in. I see uniform, uniform. I really appreciate y'all responding to that. And I, and I think you're right. Uniform is the most important thing. The idea was if we have one national standard, then we have something for everybody to work from instead of just creating just their own thing. So basically, the MUTCD is a baseline. It's a foundational document that contains all the national design, um, your applications of how to apply those traffic control devices, and honestly, where to put traffic control devices um, or pavement markings that we're going to utilize in the roadway. Um, the ultimate goal at the end of the day was to provide one uniform language that everybody would use. Now, of course, we are 50 states, uh, plus, we have uh, different municipalities. We have different provinces that are part of us as well. So we want a uniform language, but there is a little bit of variance, and we'll talk about that as we go through as well. Now, states were given a couple of options. Number one, fully adopt the MUTCD and just work from that. That is going to be your controlling document no matter what in the field. States were also given the option, and this would have to be at the legislative level, if you did not want to just use the MUTCD, what you could do is adopt the MUTCD and then adopt a state supplement, a standard plan, standard drawing, something similar to that. Or the third option, the final option is, okay, you can write your own MUTCD, but here's the catch. Um, it had better look a lot like our book and it had better sound a lot like our book. So we could probably figure out how that might work. Um, states that did that basically just took the MUTCD and changed in it what fit their state. And that's what they said. Well, look, we've written a version of the MUTCD. So to give you an idea of which states that encompasses, 
if you are looking at this map and you see the green colored states, those are the states that chose to say, you know what, we don't want to use the federal standard. We're going to adopt our own version of the MUTCD. So you have California, Utah, Texas, Missouri, uh, uh, Michigan, Ohio, Indiana. And then you go all the way to the eastern uh, side, you have Delaware, you have um, Maryland. In there, you can't see it very well, but Washington, D.C., that city actually has its own version of the MUTCD as well. Uh, the blue states were the ones who said, you know what, we're going to use the MUTCD as our primary driving device. Now, if you look in the Carolinas, they later uh, added a supplement to the MUTCD. They have standard drawings and standard plans in those states that vary a little bit from the MUTCD. And then you see the states in red, including my state of Florida, your state of Kentucky. We have the MUTCD. We certainly rely on it for things like signage and pavement markings. But when you start getting into areas of traffic control, we, we kind of have it set up the way that fits best for Kentucky or whatever state that you're in. So a red state is one that has the MUTCD, but has a state supplement as well. So you can see there's a lot of varied reactions from the states as to what we do. But again, the goal was to be uniform. It's the manual on uniform traffic control devices. So we wanted one stop shop, a repository of, okay, here are the national design standards. In other words, if I drive from Florida into Georgia, Georgia should look an uh, awful lot like Florida. Now, it's not going to be exact. Or when I drive from Georgia into Tennessee or Tennessee into Kentucky, there are going to be some slight differences here and there. Maybe it's a channelizing device. Maybe it's the way you do your pavement marking. Maybe it's the type of error board that you use. But at the very least, there's a foundational document to work off of. And that was the goal, to have one uniform language that everybody would speak and that everybody would understand regardless of what state that you were in. And for the most part, that that has been that has been the case. Um, ultimately, Federal Highway Administration, who wrote this book in conjunction with the National Committee, which I'll talk about a little bit later and where we're going, is they want orderly movement on the roads. They don't want people putting up strange things in the middle of the road that nobody understands. As it is, it's very challenging for the motoring public because they don't often know, well, why are you putting up all this orange stuff? in a work zone, or, or why that sign? What does that mean? Um, or do we have older signs up there that may confuse the motoring public? We wanted it to be orderly and efficient throughout the nation, regardless of where you were. Regardless of what state you're in, have a reasonable idea of what's going on, what's expected of you as a motorist. Now, the MUTCD applies to a lot of things. It applies to our roadways. And basically the way it works is the MUTCD applies to any roadway that is unfettered access or it is open to the motor and public. For example, a toll road, and you have toll roads in Kentucky. Those fall under the MUTCD. Um, if you are at an entrance to a shopping center, let's say you're at the uh, entrance of a Walmart. Yep, the MUTCD applies at that intersection or at that turn. That applies uh, you have to apply the MUTCD. If you're going in and out of an airport, let's, play, let's say you're flying in and out of Lexington or Louisville, you would see MUTCD related information because we have to be in compliance. Uh, if you're coming into Rough Arena or Freedom Hall or the Yum Center, wherever you're going, whatever team you follow, you're going to have to have MUTCD compliant devices on the way into those places or as you're leaving those particular places. If you have theme parks or a recreational facility. If you're going to a state park, those have to be compliant with the MUTCD. Um, let me ask of you this and let respond in chat. What about what about a military installation? Does a military installation have to be in compliance with the MUTCD? Let me know what you think. Does a military installation need to be MUTCD compliant? And we'll see what everybody comes up with. And we have some chats coming in, so I'll give a minute for those to accumulate, and then we'll take a look at them. Ah, here we go, some good numbers. So I'll go ahead and, and step in there. Um, so we have we have a varied uh, series of opinions, which is wonderful. Some say absolutely not. Some say uh, maybe. Some have we have some yeses. Some are talking about no, it's federal or or it's open to the public. So let's kind of break that down for just a moment. Again, this is just a little bit of extra uh, benefit to come into this course. So technically, the MUTCD does apply to a military installation under the following guise. That roadway that leads up to the guard shack or a sentry position, 
where it's free and open up to that point, you know, where the uh, concrete uh, comes up out of the ground where you're not getting through and you have the soldiers checking and making sure you're okay. Up to that point, the MUTCD is applicable on that roadway. But at that point where the, mo the motor public does not have unfettered access, then at that point, the MUTCD does not apply at that guard shack or at that sentry position. However, let's say you get beyond that and you have to travel on base. I do that a lot for uh, some training that I do. Well, once I'm on the military base itself and I'm free to drive around where I need to go, at that point, the MUTCD does actually kick in in those areas as well. For example, if they're doing traffic control, it needs to look like the MUTCD. Uh, their pavement markings need to be reflective of the MUTCD. Um, areas that it does not apply, uh, parking stalls, uh, parking lots. Unfortunately, the MUTCD is not written for those particular places. Even though they're open to the public, they're not subject to the specific requirements of the MUTCD. So at the entrance point or at the exit point, yes, because those can be accessed by anybody. But once you're in the parking lot, let's say a Walmart or a grocery store um, or a shopping mall, it's not that case inside the confines of that of that parking area. Everywhere else, though, would be. But let me ask you a question. Let's take that one step further and then we'll move on. What about a roadway like this? Is something like this required to be MUTCD compliant? What do you think? We'll give everybody just a couple of moments to chat in. And we have some responses come in. I do appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, yes, we have um, we have some no's. So that's good. Um, we have, if it's open to the public, yes. Interesting idea. Another, if it's open to the public, yes. And we have a lot of answers coming in fast and furious. So thank you so much for, for weighing in on that. We'll give it about five more seconds and then we'll talk about it. Because I know people want to weigh in on this particular topic. All right. Well, we're going to step out of the chat for just a moment. And the answer to this question is yes. This roadway must be MUTCD compliant. Now, we're not talking about pavement markings, but what we are saying is if there's signage, it has to be MUTCD compliant if the roadway is accessible any time of day without restriction. Now, if there's a gate across it and it's a private landowner, then no, it's not MUTCD uh, required because it's blocked off except for the owners or someone who has uh, authorization to be there. But if it's wide open, and we were, let's say, grading this roadway, then yes, we would be required to put up MUTCD compliant signs. In fact, previous to this, um, there was its own section, its own chapter of low volume roads, which is going to have a big change that we're going to talk about at the end of this morning. All right. So there are three words that I need you to know if you don't know them already. And the good news is you've already learned them. We learned them in school a long time ago. And the first one is the word shall. Shall is a standard in the MUTCD. And basically what it means is whatever comes after the word shall is a requirement. We are legally obligated to do it. We don't get to use our quote engineering judgment. If we don't like it, we don't get to just ignore it. We must do because we are legally obligated. We have a mandatory compliance for whatever comes after the word shall in the MUTCD. So that's the top level. But then there's this word should. So if shall is the higher level, where would should fall in all of this? And when I when I do this course, people say, well, you know, should's kind of like, well, you know, if you want to, you can. If you don't have to, that's not actually the way the law is interpreted in most states, including Kentucky. You have shall way up here, but that should is getting, it's not touching it, but it's closer than you might think. So should is what's called a guidance statement in the MUTCD. It's an advisory condition. And all that means is if at all possible, you should do whatever it tells you to do. And that's how it works uh, from a legal perspective. I'm not a lawyer, but if I get called in and on the stand, I'm going to say, Mr. Tyson, uh, the, the rule specifically says you should do this. Why didn't you do it? Well, if I get up there and go, because uh, I don't have to, because I don't want to, because it's a should, not a shall. First of all, it's a terrible imitation of something. I'm not even sure what it is. But secondly, if you're on the jury, you'd probably be very irritated with me because what I just said was I just didn't care. I didn't want it. In reality, what I should say is, you know what? We absolutely wanted to do so. 
but for this reason, we were not able to do it. Or perhaps it led to an unsafe condition. Therefore, we did not do it. We wanted to, we simply couldn't. So you have should, you have shall, and then you have the word may. What does may mean? Eh, you can, you can't. It's basically an option. It becomes an option statement. It's permissible, but it's not required. Now, when I say that, people go, well, we ignore anything that comes after the word may. Can I just tell you, sometimes the MUTCD, when you see a may condition, when you read it, it's actually easier and probably better in some cases, not all, than what that shall condition actually turns out to be. All right. So let's talk about um, who can, who uh, needs to know all about this. All right. So the MUTCD has a bunch of chapters or it's called parts. All right. It has nine parts or nine chapters. Chapter number one or part number one is just general information and general notes. However, it's got changes that we're going to talk about at the end of the day. Part two covers signage. And when I say signs, we have the whole list of here, everything it covers. It has general notes on our signage. And then it has regulatory signs, uh, barricades, gates, uh, warning signs, object markers. And then there are guidance signs. And some of them are just on conventional roads or local roads. And then some of them are freeways or expressways or what we would consider to be um, limited access roadways. Uh, we have toll roads that actually have specific guidance, uh, managed lanes, hot lanes, general sign information. And then finally, there's a section here at the bottom that talks about um, portable changeable message signs, a PCMS or a recreational sign or a cultural sign, um, things that are not maybe necessarily at our primary focus, but they are covered in the MUTCD. And again, we'll cover some of that towards the end of the morning. We jump to part three or chapter three, and that is a section devoted to pavement markings. Uh, part four uh, discusses specifically highway traffic signs. Um, part five would be a traffic control device for a low volume road. When we say low volume roads, we mean the roads that don't get a lot of traffic. Um, maybe mm, 400 cars a day, give or take. And every state has a little bit different interpretation of what low volume is, but something roughly in that, in that category. Part six or chapter six is the committee that I'm responsible for, and that is your temporary traffic control, your cones, your drums, your barricades, whatever it is you're putting out there to control traffic in a work zone. Well, that's my committee. That's what we work on. Uh, you have part seven, which is traffic control for your school zone. What kind of signs do you need for your signs? What, what kind of spacing do you need? That's in there. And then you have chapter eight, which is traffic control for railroads, or if you have some type of light rail, it covers that. And there are some changes coming to that as well. And then finally, part nine, which again, will have changes, is uh, traffic control for bicycle facilities, specifically designed bicycle facilities. All right, well, let's talk just for a minute about signs, if we could. And when I talk about signs, uh, this is not really what we're talking about here. Um, I guess I should give them credit. I mean, they put a chunk of concrete to ballast the hand cart. They, it appears to be a metal pole and or a baseball bat, uh, kind of in the back, so it doesn't roll. So again, some Southern ingenuity, obviously. And they did spell the words correctly. I guess there's that. But in reality, you know, as well as I do, this is not approved by the MUTCD. There's nothing about this that would be. But unfortunately, sometimes people don't know or haven't been told, or in some cases have been doing stuff for so long it's not a big deal to them. Now, hopefully not to this level. So let's talk about signs real quickly and just kind of what we're looking at. So there are really three main classifications of signage. Now, different states may break these out a little bit more, but the MUTCD has three classes here. You have what are regulatory signs, warning signs, and guide signs. When we talk about regulatory signs, you see the top two here. You see the sign, it is rectangular in shape. It's got, it's a white background, black letters, black border. If you see one of those signs, for example, it has a speed limit sign, that's regulatory, which means if you don't follow specifically what it says, then you have violated your legal obligation. In other words, the cop's going to pull you over and give you a ticket because they have the legal authority to do it because of what this signage means. Now, speed limit signs aren't the only ones. We have left turn only, right turn, uh, right lane must turn right. Um, we have all those different ones. Um, that are regulatory, if you don't follow them, then you've opened yourself up to a civil penalty. But that's not the only color. 
we have what's beneath that. You see that stop sign. That is considered to be regulatory as well. And I'll, we'll just share this with you real quickly. Does anybody know what color stop signs used to be before they were red in the United States? Anybody want to take a guess on that? Chat that in. Share with the group. What do you think? What color did stop signs used to be in the United States? And now when I ask that, there are certain places in the country that have college, uh, college sports teams like a lot of you all uh, root and cheer for. I know when I go to Durham, North Carolina, I've seen blue stop signs. I didn't say it was okay, but you have Duke, the Blue Devils there. Um, so they they fudged that a little bit. But technically, that's not regulatory. So we have some answers coming in. Um, so we have some guesses here. We have orange, uh, black on yellow. Um, they've seen white on black. Yep. Um, actually, to, to be completely candid with you, I, I go to... Um, a grocery store in certain places and they'll have that black stop sign with the white letters on it and it's not retroflective you're not going to see it at night it's wooden and that completely terrifies me but we'll set that aside for the discussions today but for those of you that guessed yellow you are correct at one time our stop signs in the united states were yellow and let me add one more thing to it they were round they weren't even octagonal in shape and in the 30s and the 40s federal highway administration got together with the states. There was great concern about nobody was stopping. And here's why. Do y'all see that yellow sign down there? It says warning. That's the color they were. And so it basically read like this. I'm driving down the roadway in 1938 or 37. We'll just make up a number. And I'm talking to my wife who's sitting uh, beside me uh, in the Model T or whatever we're driving. I'm like, honey, look, there's a stop condition up ahead. That's interesting. And then we just keep on going because there was no legal authority to hold us to actually stop at that stop sign. And so what the MUTCD said for the very first time, and remember, how fast were those cars going? Not super fast. How good were the roads? Not really good. But there was already concern about excessive speed and not stopping in a safe manner. So in 1948, that version of the MUTCD was released, and it said a stop sign shall be octagonal in shape, brand new shape, with a red background and white lettering. And from there forward, that has to be the stop sign. It has to be the shape of our stop flow paddle. If we're in a flagging operation, it's got to look that way because the MUTCD specifically says so. And, and by the way, don't think they didn't pick red on purpose because it was the color of a stop signal at a signalized intersection. So that's why they did it. Hopefully people make that correlation. Um, so outside of regulatory signs, we also have warning signs. We have the orange ones right here. These orange warning signs are for a work zone only, an active work zone. So you have to be prepared to stop. We'll have road work ahead, utility work ahead, survey crew ahead, um, and a flagging op operation, one lane road, the flagger symbol sign, all different types of orange warning signs, but they are specific to a temporary traffic control situation. In other words, the work zone is not going to be there forever. It has a limited amount of time, whether it be a couple of hours, a couple of days, a couple of months, maybe even a year. Uh, it certainly can be that way as well. We have the yellow warning signs, which I just talked about the stop sign a minute ago. Um, yellow warning signs are simply a warning condition. In other words, unless we come out here and change the curvature of this roadway for this particular sign we're showing, uh, that roadway is going to look that way until we change it. So this warning sign would always be applicable until we change the road, and then we would have to take it out or put a different sign in. We have the green signs, which are guidance signs. If we're going down a highway or down the interstate, you're looking um, to know, well, what exit do I get off on? Or if you come in a, in a larger metropolitan area, you come to an intersection where it says uh, left, uh, turn left, and it's this road, turn right, it's that road. It's one road with two names. Very confusing for people. Or if you have big intersections, um, they may say next intersection is uh, Gardner Drive or something like that. Uh, we have guidance signs, which are the blue ones. Um, they are more informational, but we classify them as guide signs in the MTCD or historical or natural uh, information does get classified as a guidance sign as well um, with that uh, brown shape. There are about three or four colors in MUTCD we don't use for signs simply because we haven't created that particular category of signs. Now, why does the MUTCD matter? Because, and these numbers need to be updated as we get the 2022 numbers, but right now uh, in 2020, we had 36,000 people die on our highways. And 25% of those folks were in horizontal, horizontal curves. And you look at this and it becomes very clear why. Oh, we've got those chevrons out there and they're supposed to be retroreflective. But at night, on that kind of curve, um, the lighting's got to be good. 
People have to be focused, not playing on their phone, not drowsy driving, not distracted. A lot of things at play here. And the MUTCD specifically tells us, well, what do the Chevrons need to look like? What size do they need to be? Um, the average crash rate is three times what it is in another highway segment. So three times what you would find on, let's say, a straight road. One more I want to give you here on that is something like this. Again, in a more mountainous area um, or a pass, yeah, you need this kind of stuff, especially for sharp curves. But again, no light out there, especially at night. So it's some very dangerous opportunities. Um, the question becomes, um, oh, um, and Miss Megan, will you hold me to this? Uh, John asked a question about when our change is required. Will you make sure we cover that at the end, please? Um, I'd appreciate it. John, we will get to that, I promise. So in terms of the MUTCD, um, they determine for a traffic control device to be effective, you got to meet five requirements. Okay, it's got to have a need. So don't just throw stuff out there by the road if there's no purpose to it, because then you're just cluttering up your clear zone or the roadway. You got to get people's attention, which is really hard because everyone's on their phone. Or if it's me, I'm fussing with my kids in the back seat, or I'm eating or whatever, playing with my radio. Um, we've all seen different things, people going down the road. Um, I don't know, maybe on a call on their phone, um, texting, messaging, whatever, um, all these different distractions, maybe shaving, maybe putting on makeup, everybody does different things. But in the middle of all that, that's why our devices are so important, because we have to, to pop and stand out to people. When we get their attention, finally, it's got to be very clear, a very simple meaning. Hopefully, we get their respect. That means our stuff looks correct. It's clean. It's not beat up and and no longer retroreflective, which means light shines back to the motors, which we'll cover here in just one second. Or it looks like we know what we're actually doing or we're supposed to be working. We're professional in what we're doing. And ultimately, all that is great. But if you don't give me time to figure out what's going on and tell me what to do, I I'm not going to know what to do. And so we have to give the motors time to read, to understand, and then react to what it is we're asking them to do. Um, we want to make sure that our stuff is retroreflective at night. Uh, sign color, sign shape is important, obviously. But on top of that, um, you want to make sure that things are retroreflective. It literally means light hits that retroreflective material, light shines back to the light source. That should be our signs. This stop sign should light up like 12 o'clock noon in the middle of the day. It pitch black dark at night. Now think about how many signs in your area, maybe where you live or, or where you travel, where if you come up at night, you know there's a stop sign there. But if you didn't, you might not see it if there wasn't a really good light there. So that's one of the things the MUTCD really requires is be retroreflective. In terms of retroreflective, we talk about um, our vests. On the left, we have a class one vest. That is not appropriate in the roadway, in the right of way. Can't do it. Maybe that works in a warehouse. Maybe that works um, in a parking lot. And even with that, I'd be scared to do it. I want to have this class two or a class three. Class two does not have sleeves in terms of a vest. Class three does. And it's really about the amount of retroreflective material, how many square inches. The MUTCD actually outlines that, okay? The other thing to remember with your high-vis safety apparel, make sure it's got a tag or a label on it because if there's ever an OSHA issue or a problem, they're looking for that tag. Now, we can visually verify this, but it's that tag. It says it, it shall be this, and it must be labeled as such. So one of the shalls will have a label on it. All right. Uh, in terms of, let's just hit temporary traffic control real quick. We talked about the orange background. Uh, black border, you've got either a black text or a picture on it. Um, depending on what your state supplement says, we typically are going to use 48 by 48, but there are times we can go smaller depending on the kind of roadway or the kind of operation. And that is a, a consultation of your state standards. If you're ever in a work zone and you have yellow signs up there, um, you don't have to take them out. You don't have to cover them as long as they're still applicable. If this road ain't changing shape, leave it up there. Just don't put your signs so close together that people can't see them. The MUTCD does not allow for that. Um, just some things to think about that the MUTCD also covers. Uh, flagging operations. It talks about that in part six. This is a doozy of a flagging operation because the fellow's on his phone. Uh, I took this picture because I was in the flagging operation. Or maybe something like this. That's not what we're looking for in a flagging operation. That fella, he's in trouble. For a lot of reasons, sitting down, paddles too low based on what the METCD says. You can't be sitting. Um, you have to be facing traffic, squaring your body up. All right. Well, that's all the time that we have for signs. I want to talk a little bit about pavement markings if we can. Uh, we're just going to let this one be uh, exactly what it is. There were some challenges here. 
to how the pavement marking worked out, the MTCD calls for a little higher standard. Kentucky, the transportation cabinet certainly calls for a higher standard. So do our local cities, counties, municipalities. But unfortunately, we still have some of these out there. Um, I give respect for going around the little island there. I mean, that's dedication. I've got to give it to them. And well, you know, it, maybe it's not our job to pick up uh, roadkill, but uh, somebody probably should have before we came out there painting over the top of it. Um, in terms of pavement markings, uh, we really have two categories in the MUTCD, the longitudinal markings, which are more for guidance or location. That's these right here. Or you have what's called the transverse markings, which are our warnings or their regulatory information. You can see these pointing here, these cross hatchings. Um, or you may have lanes that say, hey, straight through or turn left. Or you may have a roadway number painted on the pavement. For example, uh, interstate, let's say Interstate 75. All right, well, we would have the Interstate 75 logo and designation on the pavement to let you know which lane you're in or which lane you need to get in, okay? Um, a dotted line, it's not broken, but a dotted line, notice it says shall be used for non-continuing lanes. What are those? Lane drops, auxiliary lanes, which are, which are uh, passing lanes or speed change lanes, um, an acceleration lane or deceleration lane. Normally it's gonna have the dotted line, um, and this is for freeways, expressways, what we would call conventional roadways. Uh, the white markings separate traffic in one direction. We use them as an edge line, so we use them on, on the edge of the roadway. Yellow markings separate traffic going in opposite directions. I'm on the left edge of the roadway of a divided or one-way highway or ramp. Or we separate uh, two-way left turn lanes or reversible lanes uh, for the others. Um, we'll use a double yellow you know, on a two-lane road, which means we don't cross it unless we're specifically uh, regulated to do so, let's say by a flagger who shut down one of the lanes and we have to do um, one lane roadway. So we're alternating traffic on both ends. But in general, we're not supposed to cross a double yellow. Um, the MUTCD also says, hey, you can use different color pavement markings, right? Um, for bicycles, you can have green pavement marking. There's a bunch of different ways to do this. The MUTCD allows um, and different color schemes of the green. Some have a, a, a more brighter fluorescent green. Some have the more hunter green. We have the khaki green. Um, there are different ways, but green as a pavement marking is reserved uh, for a bicycle only. Um, just out of curiosity, do any of y'all use the green pavement markings uh, for uh, designating or noting a bicycle only pathway or facilities? Anybody do that here? Just curious if you would weigh in, just kind of give me an idea of what you all are using or what you see. Um, we have some information coming here. All right, we'll let those just gather for just a minute. Anybody using the green coloring scheme for bike lanes on the pavement? All right, doesn't look like anybody is currently doing it, so that's okay, but it's in there. You can certainly do that again. You always want to check your state supplement to make sure that there is no conflict between the MUTCD and your state supplement. And that gets down into the weeds sometimes for, let's say, traffic control devices. On a larger roadway, we're using 36-inch cones or maybe the 42-inch channelizers or a certain type of barricade. The MUTCD says you can use as small as an 18-inch cone. I don't know any roadway that's active that I'm putting an 18-inch cone out there. So there are some differences between the federal standard and what the state standard may actually say. Um, and I understand the city of Lexington, uh, thank you, Jason, is using uh, the green color. And again, that's provided for in the MUTCD and the state adopts that. They may tweak it to fit what works best for their motors and for their clients or customers that, you know, they're citizens, but it is in there. Here's one thing you may not have seen or you may, there is another color that you can use. You can use red to note bus pavement markings. Um, now, you don't see this a lot all over the country, but it is out there in a couple of spots. I know in North Carolina, I've seen it a couple of times. I've actually seen it over in Missouri a couple of times. So that red, which is, now think about it, typically red is a stop condition, right? But in the MUTCD, it can also be used as a bus pavement marking if you so choose. It hasn't gained wide acceptance around the country, but it is an option that you have. Um, in terms of toll lanes or managed lanes, we are allowed to use purple. Purple is specifically designed for those toll roads in terms of pavement markings. And if you look really close, you'll see it's not just the color, it's actually the travel lanes themselves are striped. Those pavement markings are purple on purpose 
to note for the motorist what type of lane they're getting into because people make mistakes as they go under these signage. Well, am I in am I in the toll side or am I on the cash side? What do I do? And if you know, it's very hard sometimes to understand, especially if you're going to the high rate of speed. And so they will encourage us to put down the colored pavement markings just as a visual clue to the motor in public that, oh, that's the lane I should be in, or, oh, this is the lane that I'm actually in. Now, the challenge that we all deal with, whether you're an elected official, whether you work for the transportation cabinet, whether you're a city, county, a local, even tribal lanes, it applies to them, even at that as well, is how do we get the motor in public to understand this? Because they don't come to the classes we go to. They don't see the webinars that we see. And so a challenge for us in implementing the MUTCD is we're hoping that people understand what it is that we're doing. The idea from the federal standard and from the transportation cabinet is if we do it uniform, we do it the same way every time. Every contractor does it this way specifically. Uh, for my locals, if you're setting up traffic control, let's say you're flushing out a manhole, whatever it is you're doing, you're setting up a, a little work zone, do it the same way. Use the correct signs. And then that way, as people you know, go through life seeing that, they'll start to put two and two together. It's like a right lane closed and a merge symbol with a right lane ending. You know, it has the line and the dot, dot, dash. That's a merge. That's a, a lane closure. We put those together because they basically mean the same thing. They're represented differently, but they're the same item. And again, that's one of those things where by repetition, hopefully the motor in public is able to learn and understand. Um, there are uh, some pavement markers I want to hit real quick, specifically crosswalks. Um, because we're going to talk more about that uh, in terms of the MUTCD, especially in temporary traffic control here in just a moment. Um, but, you know, we have uh, a couple of different ways you can do crosswalks, again, depending on what your supplement calls for. Um, but if you have a crosswalk, you need to have it on all four corners. Um, that is in the MUTCD. Um, you want to have a white solid line in advance, or the stop lines, I should say, in advance of that crosswalk. Otherwise, people won't stop till they're sitting in the crosswalk. And in some cases, even with the stop bars, people still stop in the crosswalk. But the MUTC specifically says, hey, give them a stop bar before you get to the crosswalk. Um, if you're on a vertical roadway, then the center left lane is shown separated from the adjacent lane um, by a solid line, just to make it clear for everybody where the lanes are going, what it is you're supposed to do. Here's what I mean by that. There are really three different kinds of crosswalks that we'll ever deal with. We have the top one here, which is longitudinal. We have the diagonal to the right, or we have the continental at the bottom. All of those are approved at the MUTCD level. Um, but, but the bottom one, right, is the continental, and you have the diagonal, which is the one on the right. Those are really for, for visual appeal. If you're in an area where you have a lot of traffic and they don't stop very well in front of a crosswalk, don't use the top one. Don't use the longitudinal. Uh, crosswalk with the stripes, the two the two lines, people's visual is not picking it up in time. But if you start putting something out there like this, that is angled, right? It's it's diagonal in shape. All of a sudden, that gets people's attention. Or if you have these straight lines, at the very least, it, it gets your attention. Now, the one thing about the straight lines, I do want to say, do not space those lines so far apart that it it fits where uh, your, your wheel path would go between those white lines. You want to keep them tight based on MUTCD recommendations because otherwise they kind of follow that thinking, oh, my car should drive through here because the lines are spread out so far. You want to make sure that you keep those close. Um, don't get creative on this one. I know there are times we'll do uh, special markings or special uh, notifications or remembrances, but in general, and then and that's a special event. But overall, for our pavement markings, Use the same marking style throughout the intersection. Don't do like this picture has and have three different kinds all in that same intersection because it's confusing to people. And to be honest, it's visual pollution because there's so many ideas going on, a person might get confused. But if you have all four corners diagonal, all right, everybody can see what's going on. And again, they get used to that. And that's what they want in Kentucky and every other state. Do it one kind of way in one particular section that will trigger people's minds to understand what's going on. Uh, last few things here on pavement markings, and then we will get started into the updates for the MUTCD, the proposed updates, if you will. Um, there is a thought process in the MUTCD that symbol markings are better than words. Very simply put, we have people on the roadway that English is not their first language, or let me take it a step further. We have people who graduate high school are pushed out with a diploma and they can't read. 
and they can't write. Unfortunately, I had someone in a live class a couple of months ago that was in that condition. I, I can't help you with a test. I'm not allowed to do so. So for those kind of folk, and again, we don't mock them. We, we want to lift them up and encourage them. We got to help them when they're out on the roadway. Or if you're coming up to a crosswalk, they, they may not be able to read the words on, on the sign that says which roadway that you're doing. And so symbols are way better in that term than pavement markings, uh, just with the words. Um, however, if you're going to uh, pavement markings uh, or these type, make sure uh, they're white and make sure your pavement markings are retro reflective. All right. Got to be able to be seen at night. Um, there are requirements for RPMs, uh, raised uh, pavement markers. We don't have time to get into that today, but you want to make sure as well, because when the pavement markings begin to fail, hopefully the RPMs still light up at night when your headlights hit them. And hopefully they're not turning red because that means you're going the wrong way. And in certain areas, there's a lot of one-way roads. And for out-of-towners like me coming into an area that just doesn't know, or my Google Maps or my Waze map has let me down, that can get you in real trouble real, real quickly. And then you want to make sure that you don't put so many words down on the pavement that people can't read it in the time they're flying past it. Because if you're on an interstate and the speed limit says 65 miles an hour, what are people really driving? 70, 75, 80 miles per hour? You're not going to read five rows of text going that fast down the road. So it says no more than three rows of text. And it's got to fit inside the one lane. Please do not put words down that take up a bunch of lanes because there's so many letters to it. Those letters, those words individually must fit within a single travel lane. Now, you may put them in more than one travel lane, that whole message, but you just can't have them spreading out one, just kind of growing tentacles and growing out into all of them. They would have to be specifically designed and placed into each travel lane and able to be read. All right. Well, having said that, let's kind of get to thinking about what the 2023 updates are going to look like. First of all, let me give you, here is the way it works. So I'm on the National Committee. I told you that earlier. The National Committee, based on research, based on uh, local agencies reaching out to us with issues and problems and needing clarification or thinking, hey, this might be a better way of doing things, We'll reach out to our committee. Uh, my committee meets in January uh, in DC every year. And then we have a midsummer or a mid year meeting uh, somewhere else. Uh, this year it's in Tacoma, Washington. I think next year it's in Delaware. Regardless, we have two meetings a year. Plus, we have monthly and in some cases weekly conference calls, depending on what's going on. Things come to my committee. We wordsmith it, we write it, and then we submit it to what's called our sponsors. The sponsors are groups like APWA, American Public Works Association. ATSA, American Traffic uh, Safety Services Association. All these national groups, there's 34 sponsors. We send those rules out to them and they look at them and they apply them to what they do for a living. And they'll, they'll make changes or sometimes they'll come back and say, hey, great idea. The sponsors all sign off on it. Regardless of how it works, once the sponsors are good with it, it comes back to us. We take it and make sure, hey, we're still good with it. And then it gets forwarded on to Federal Highway. At that point, Federal Highway looks at it and says, all right, let's make a decision on it. And if we agree with it, we'll place it in the next version of the MUTCD. Now, the most recent version of the MUTCD is printed in 2009. They did some textual updates in 2012, but it didn't trigger a new manual. So uh, let's see, Miss Megan, let's do a little math this morning. We're in 2023. That was 2009. So what's that? 14 years since the last book came out. So there's a lot of updates that are going to come. Uh, last I heard, there were something like 400 updates that were submitted to Federal Highway. The issue is we're not going to know what they fully are until they come out, but I do have the list of the major things that are expected. What will happen is when the new book comes out, I will spend about two weeks going through it with a fine tooth comb, lining up what the old book was, and here were the changes, and just kind of make sure what got in and what did not, because that's going to affect our courses, but it also affects us all in our daily work anyway. So we will do that. There was a, a bill signed in Congress a year and a half ago that simply said, and as part of this, the MUTCD will be updated and will be printed no later than May of 2023. That is a self-imposed deadline by the federal government. Will it hold? I don't know. But my guesstimate is probably sometime in early to mid-June is when they'll finally release it and say it's ready, right about the time we have our mid-year meeting. Um, if you're interested, in getting involved with the National Committee. I'm sorry that it doesn't pay anything, but it's pretty awesome to do. Um, 
So if you want to do that, reach out to Miss Megan and I can get all that information, everybody. Um, you can follow up with that. There's an application process. Um, you have to come to the meetings every year. Otherwise, they will not let you on the committee. They want you to be active. Uh, I'm on a task force and such as that. Well, several, actually, um, for specific things. All right. We waited long enough. Let's do it. Here come the updates. Here we go. All right. So we are working on the 11th edition. Our job has been done for two years now, more than that. Some of these rules go back three, four, and five years that they were written and proposed. Now here they come, hopefully. So part one was general news or general information, general notes. Well, here's what's coming for part one. And that is simply this. Um, they want to put in that, in that manual that any uh, document that is an addition to the MUTCD, by that I mean our state supplement, our standard drawings, um, we have a flip book in Kentucky that has all of that information. You know, let's say I'm doing a flagging operation or doing work zone stuff. You know, we have the flip book that give us the outline of what's our science based and all of those things. If it is a document or a manual that we create and we use as a state, they want to specifically clarify in chapter one that that is a supplement and it had better look and sound a whole lot like the MUTCD, which honestly, the terminology is pretty much the same across state lines. So we're going to be okay with that substantial compliance. In other words, we can't just write crazy things and say, well, it's our supplement. We'll do what we want. Uh, the, the federal government says there are limits to what the states can do with that. Um, how many of you live or work in an area, a small town, that has a really nice welcome? Welcome to this town. And maybe you have uh, a beautiful sign out there. Um, some places will look like boulders or tr plant trees or certain things to really beautify the entrance to that town. To, to make it look as good as possible. We want tourism. We want to be proud of where we live and where we work. Um, there's going to be some rules and regulations. Um, what year was last update? Um, Brian asked. Uh, that was 2009 was the last update. So there's a whole lot of stuff fixing to come about to come our way. I say fixing. My grandma and me. So they're going to put some specific restrictions on our welcome signs, uh, how big they can be. Uh, how large the lettering can be, what is the font or what is the design of those letters. Uh, that's going to be coming as well. So there's going to be a lot of stuff just in terms of that. Okay. Uh, part two or chapter two, if you will, um, is going to cover signage. Here's a big thing. It's a little esoteric. It's kind of out there, but let's try to bring it all in. Using our speed limit signs, and I'm not on the sign committee for this, but I'll tell you what it is. They want us as a state practitioner, as a local, as a contractor to use our speed limit signs to create what we would call a speed culture. What that simply means is they want us to use those signs to help change the attitude of the motorist. That may mean putting out more speed limit signs more closely. That may be looking at the speed of our roads and say, are they appropriate for the amount of traffic that we have? Um, are they appropriate for the width of the travel lanes that we have or for the layout of the roadway? They're going to ask us to use signs to help build a speed culture because right now we have a speeding culture. They want us to create a safer speed culture by utilizing our, our speed limit signs a little bit more actively. Um, there'll be some changes coming to the horizontal alignment warning signs like this. It's going to look a little bit different, more than likely, for what we've been doing previously. And then um, our PCMS, you know, those portable changeable message signs that we have, there's going to be some rules coming down about what we can say, what we can't say, especially related to a non-traffic control situation, okay? Um, I go to different states and they give the fatality statistic, right, on those uh, dynamic message signs. Well, if you're putting those on the, the changeable message signs, they don't want that, to be honest with you. And this really comes back to a complaint from an engineer in Tennessee, from uh, University of Tennessee, Knoxville. So he's a Tennessee Vol grad who complained in Nashville uh, because a Vanderbilt grad had put anchor down, which is the Vandy fight slogan, and complained to Federal Highway that they should take a look at what signage we're using. Federal Highway initially said, no, it's fine. States know what they're doing. But now they're coming back to it. So there's probably going to be some changes to that. In terms of pavement markings, uh, we're going to require six-inch width lines. If you're on a roadway that's greater than 40 miles an hour, and that's going to be re, uh, regarding autonomous vehicles, which we're about to get into in part five. Um, and then they're going to require chevrons for a gore area. 
Now, typically, a gore area that is that that triangle, that V shape that we create. For example, if you're getting off a roadway and, and getting onto an exit, we don't have anything sitting in the middle. That's sort of a wide open area. Well, now they're going to be requiring chevrons in those gore areas just to give people a little bit more notice to get over. Or this roadway is going this way, so you better get in the right lane. Well, here, follow this, if you will. And again, that is specifically targeted at autonomous vehicles because they are taking pictures with their camera and try, it's trying to process all the time. Um, part four, we're going to have some signals. It's going to be specific to uh, the, the rectangular rapid flashing beacons, the RRFB. That's at crosswalks, but that's going to be something that's going to get updated. And they are actually adding specifically in the MUTCD a requirement for bike signals at intersections that have bikes. So that's going to be uh, very, very interesting. I don't know how cost effective it's going to be, but that's what they're doing. Here's probably one of the biggest changes of all. Part five is going away. I told you this morning that part five was low volume roads. It has its own section of how to deal with it. However, because of such a push for autonomous vehicles, connected autonomous vehicles, autonomous vehicles are now taking over part five. That will be specifically related to autonomous vehicles um, and what we have to do to make those safe on the roadway from a, a, transport, a transportation perspective um, as practitioners, low volume roads is going away. So we will not have that anymore. Um, there's really not much that's going to get rolled into anything else. So that's that's kind of going away in the next MUTCD version. Um, and it's going to, again, be very specific in those connected autonomous vehicles. Uh, part six, my committee, temporary traffic control devices, the orange stuff that we put out there. This is big for contractors um, and, and for us locals as well. And at the state level, there's going to be a requirement that we have an accessible pedestrian signal control for rerouted sidewalks. What that simply means is the MUTCD says, and I'm not quoting, but it's close. If you take away a sidewalk from someone, you have to give them another sidewalk back as much as practical. And that sidewalk must have as close to matching characteristics if you're an individual with a disability, which uh, the MUTCD covers. You know, you're walking with a cane or you're in a manual wheelchair. We can't we can't have people tipping out because there's uneven spots in the sidewalk or the curb ramps are not the correct slope. Or if we're shutting down a sidewalk, there's nothing that uh, a, a pedestrian with a with a vision impairment can't tap with their cane and feel something solid there. So to help with this, they're going to have us put in a uh, an accessible pedestrian signal for every time we reroute somebody on the sidewalk. That's going to and it has to be auditory. Okay, for those who may have a vision issue, it's got to talk to them. So there's going to be some cost um, that's going to be coming with that. Uh, part seven covers schools. Uh, there are a few updates on that, but really nothing major. Um, part eight, which is rail, they want us to form what are called diagnostic teams uh, to determine what needs to be done at a highway rail crossing. So it's going to kind of increase the amount of paperwork and the amount of people involved in decision making around rail. Um, obviously, we have to work with the rail companies that own that as well, but they want a full team. It's called the diagnostic team. Um, and then part nine, which is the bicycles. Um, there's a lot going on here. There's going to be significant material on bikes. Um, having separate bike lanes. And probably the other one that I think is going to take up the most time is there are going to be some infrastructure requirements that are very maintenance heavy. So if you have a lot of bike lanes, get ready because they're going to put uh, more uh, requirements on those and how to keep those and maintain those as we go through. All right. Well, I got about five minutes left. Uh, Miss Megan, that is all I had. I did have the one question I want to come back to, which is when do you have to make that change if there is a change to MUTCD? Let's use schools for a moment. Uh, the school bus sign. How many of you still have the school bus stop ahead signs, the text, rather than the yellow green uh, school bus picture where the school bus is stopping? If you have those, you haven't changed those. You don't have to run out and change them immediately. But if there's any rehab going on in that area, if there's paving operations or some type of maintenance in that area, at that point, they're going to require you to make that change. Um, but there is no predetermined time. It's as soon as practical is how the MUTCD is written um, for some of these changes. Unless it's like a retroreflective sign, then you need to make that change immediately. If there's a problem, you can use a retroreflectometer to check those. But in general, you get an undetermined grace period unless it's something like a sign um, that needs to be addressed immediately or pavement markings that need to be addressed immediately. Um, those, those are an immediate need. But for the, some of the others, it's as you can or as 
maintenance operations uh, take place in that particular area. All right, somebody else. Thank you, Scott. Any other questions today, guys? All right, we have one coming in. Will the updated version be available to the public without cost? Thousand percent, yes. And Brian, that is a big old book to print. Um, if you only work in certain sections, like let's say you do, do pavement markings, I would go into the, um, just Google MUTCD and it'll take you to the Federal Highway website or just go to fhwa.org. It'll take you to the MUTCD and you can print it out in PDF version, absolutely free. Just print the parts you want or you can actually buy the book. But like I said, it's, uh, you can't see very well with my thing, but it's about that thick with all nine parts and it's going to get bigger. Because the one thing I didn't get to tell you is there's a lot more drawings that are going into that book. Right now, there are 46 what they call TAs, typical applications on normal roads. Expect about four or five drawings of nothing but roundabouts. Wow. How to do traffic control around roundabouts. If you don't like roundabouts, I'm sorry, but we're pushing forward with those. So there's a lot more emphasis on those you're going to see in the drawings as well. Yep. Okay. So Brian says he does part six. Yep. You absolutely can do that. And it's free. Um, so yeah, I would do that too. I have a PDF and I have the hard copy, but I'm going to, I'm going to print a new hard copy, um, when it comes out. Don't tell my bosses, but it's expensive, but we'll do it because we need it. It looks worth it. Yes, ma'am. It certainly is. Plus you look really smart when you whip out the book. 